In March of 2004, Frank and Bella would move from their home in North California to just outside of Hendersonville in Tennessee. They had scored a great deal on a beautiful piece of property and land, an old two-story renovated farmhouse with a full basement, an attic, and all the works. Everything had been completely renovated and it looked beautiful. The outside was literally 30 acres of heaven on earth. A beautiful wraparound porch was added. There was a pond and a makeshift fire pit not too far off with a wooden bench. Off on the far side of the property was an older tool shed that had been worked on here and there. Surrounding this lush, beautiful 30 acres of land was sparse woods, meadows, creeks, and the further out you go, the woods became much more dense. The first time ever seeing the house in person for Frank and Bella was when they actually set foot on the property to get the keys from the realtor. And Frank and Bella were taken aback by just how beautiful this place was and could not believe that they had got it for such a steal. Before their purchase, the house had sat vacant for about four or so years and seemed like the perfect place to retire as Frank and Bella had been looking for a place to move out into the country where things are quieter, there's much more a sense of community and peace and quiet. Plus, their children had lived on the other side of Nashville and they wanted a place for their grandchildren to come and play. So Frank, being 60 and nearly retired, was thinking of all the things he could do to add to the property for his grandchildren. Things like play structures or a giant sand pit and maybe even a tree house out in the meadows for his grandchildren to play in. And while walking through the house for the first time, everything seemed to just fall right into place. For Bella and Frank, every single box was ticked. It was perfect. But there was a couple strange things here and there. Of course, at the time, Frank and Bella thought nothing of it and didn't really want to ask questions because they were sure it's really nothing. But the strangest thing of all was the basement door had been nailed shut. Not padlocked or left unusable, but actually nailed shut. Somebody took the effort and time to make sure that this door was not opening in any way, shape, or form. What was also strange is on the outside of the house where the basement was, the basement window had even been boarded up from the inside. Frank and Bella did not bother to ask the realtor why and just had assumed that maybe something had happened that rendered the basement unusable or potentially unsafe. Before the very end of the walkthrough with keys in hand, Bella did decide to ask the realtor why the basement was nailed shut and the realtor didn't know and just suspected that possibly it was a black mold issue and in order to keep its residents from breathing in the spores, they had nailed it shut. Seemed like a pretty reasonable explanation for the time being. With that set, Frank and Bella happily moved in and they were enjoying every second. Now, Frank and Bella were a little bit on the older side. Bella was 56, a retired nurse who had spent a lot of her time and energy in the medical field and was looking to relax with an early retirement. And Frank, who had just turned 60 in January, was looking to now start his retirement and focus on enjoying his grandchildren and his hobbies. Within a week's time of fully moving in, Frank and Bella had their children over and their grandchildren. And of course, their grandchildren loved the property. They would go out and play in the meadows. They'd run around in the field. They'd go play hide and seek in the woods. They enjoyed it. They'd sit in the fire pit, roast marshmallows. They'd pretend to go fishing in the pond, even though at the time in March, there was no fish in it. And at this time in life, Frank and Bella could not be more satisfied with life. Having bought the perfect piece of property, they're now close to their own kids and grandchildren. Everything is perfect. And so it was now that Frank had decided he really wanted access to that basement because the curiosity was getting the best of him and he wanted to see what was down there. He really wanted to see what the issue was and if it was small enough, maybe he could repair it or hire somebody to repair it. So stubbornly, one day he pulled out all the nails of the door, working very meticulously and was finally able to get the door open. And one thing that Frank noted immediately was just how ice cold the basement was the second he began going down the stairs. He noted that right away the light switch in the basement didn't work which makes sense. There's probably a wiring issue or some sort of electrical problem that he could probably fix. And after shining his light around, it just looked like a regular old basement that hadn't been used. It had a very strong musty odor, but there were virtually no signs of mold anywhere. And so he's standing there down in the basement with the flashlight scanning around and he cannot find any reason why this room would have been boarded up. It didn't make any sense. Other than the basement at the time being exceptionally chilly, 
He was loving it. And in fact, directly behind him against the wall was a workbench. And as he's shining his light over it, there's even compartments for his tools and he could do his hobby of building birdhouses down here, which is something he had loved to do at the time. And so right away, he began getting a ladder and checking the wiring, looking for anything faulty and why it wasn't working. And by the end of that same day, after fixing some small wiring issues, Frank had now a fully lit basement and was even able to pry the wooden board off the basement window to let some natural light in. As you can imagine in some horror story cliche, this is, of course, where things begin to take a turn. As often as Frank could, he would go down to this basement and move his tools around and begin to do all sorts of small little woodworking projects from building benches to old birdhouses, and he enjoyed every bit of it. He enjoyed the peace and quiet of being able to work by himself and to actually have room to move around because in his old house in North California, he was cramped in his little workspace in his garage and now he had all the free room he wanted. But much of the time, he couldn't quite understand why the basement was so cold. Now, naturally, it's understandable that with basements being underground, it's going to be colder, but it was so cold down here that you could see your breath, while upstairs could be 70, 75 degrees. And after inspecting around, there were no drafts, there was no mysterious sources of air blowing through, and he could not describe it. It felt like at all times, this basement was 40 to 45 degrees. And the second you go up the stairs and out into the main kitchen, everything was fine. So the very first time that something weird had happened to Frank was when he was down in the basement spending time at his workbench working on a birdhouse he was making for his wife when he had sworn that somebody had come down the stairs and was in the basement with him. Of course, he had his back turned to where his workbench was and he ignored it, thinking his wife was coming down to maybe give him a cup of coffee or bring him a sandwich. But when the feeling persisted like somebody was just standing there, he even asked, Bella, are you there? And when he went to turn around after no response, there was nobody in the room. Frank thought that to be strange at first, but kept on working. And then Frank felt a cold energy move from behind him that moved to right up next to him. And he said he felt his blood run cold. This had distracted Frank so much, he actually put down his birdhouse and began scanning the room, thinking either he's crazy or somebody's playing a trick on him. But Bella is upstairs in the family room reading a book and there's no reason why these things should be happening. Completely unable to explain what was going on, Frank just decided that's enough for today. Maybe he's overly tired, so he goes back upstairs, closes the basement door, and that's the last little bit of time he invests in the basement for that day. Now, what's also very interesting is right around the same time period, probably no more than a week or so after he had gained access to the basement, Frank's son began dropping off his dog, Max, over at the house because of the property and the fact that he could run around and play, and Frank's son lived in an apartment. And so while he was at work to keep his dog happy, he would just go to his parents' house and drop Max off. And this is where it's strange with Max because Frank couldn't understand this, but a lot of the day, Max would sit there lying on the floor, staring intently at the basement door. And he would just sit there whimpering and whining. <laughs> Like there was really something wrong and Frank couldn't understand it. And there were times where Max would still run around and frolic and be happy, but he would spend hours sitting in front of this basement door, just whining and staring intently like there was something or someone behind there. He did not figure anything that had happened to him down there. And this being a coincidence at all, he figured the two were completely separate and there was genuinely something wrong with Max. That maybe Max didn't like the basement for whatever reason, but he never went into detail. Within days of Frank returning to the basement to do more woodworking, he grew more and more uncomfortable with being down there. He began to describe the ominous feelings that would accompany him while he was in the basement even though there was clearly nobody else in there. The feeling of being watched or that he wasn't alone or like he was in danger. And that sometimes he would have these cold wisps of air blowing on his neck from out of nowhere. And that over time, he began to feel more and more uncomfortable in his own basement. And at this point, this has been no more than two weeks since he had gained entry into the basement. This was all happening very fast. Now, Frank had never spoken a word of this at all to Bella because... I mean, there was no point. Frank just figured it was all in his head and maybe he was just adjusting to the new house and maybe he was overly tired and not getting enough sleep. So that's what he had believed it to be at the time. Meanwhile, Bella began now experiencing her own things. It was now in early April and probably right around Easter when Bella was upstairs making dinner. And as she's doing dishes in the sink, 
she sees a figure walk right past the kitchen window. Looking up and not seeing anything, she figured it was her son and his girlfriend because they had been expecting them over for dinner that evening. But he wasn't to be there for another hour and a half. And so she thought, well, that's strange. He must have got off work early. So she stops what she's doing, walks over to the front door, opens the front door in hopes to greet her son and was wondering why he decided to walk all the way around the porch. She saw no one nor did she see his car. Puzzled and confused by this, she walked down to the porch, looked around, didn't see a trace of anybody from anywhere, and knew that deep down, she swore she saw somebody walk by the window, but could not figure it out. She even asked Frank, and of course, Frank was just as clueless as she was about it. And just a day and a half after this, when she was spending some quality time with her grandkids, she heard a knock at the door. And puzzled, because they have not had anybody come and visit them yet other than their own kids, she went to go look through the people of the door to see who it was, and it was a man in a gray, a darkish gray trench coat and a, an old-style hat who had his head down so she couldn't really see who he was. But as she's looking through the peephole, she notices that after he knocked, he actually turned around and began walking away. And as she's looking through the people, studying this mysterious man who had knocked at the door and was now walking away, she went to open the door and he had mysteriously vanished. This, of course, had weirded Bella right out because not even a split second before, she had just seen him through the peephole walking down the porch steps to go out to the driveway. There's nowhere he could have possibly gone, and so for him to just vanish like this did not make any sense whatsoever. Bella began to believe that there was more going on than what she had initially thought. With the small handful of strange things that have already been transpiring on the property itself, Frank and Bella weren't ready to jump to any conclusions just yet. But... One event would drastically change Frank's opinion and make him believe that there was something now in the house. Moving into mid to late April, Bella had decided to go spend the evening or night alone with her daughter. And so Frank was left at the house all by himself for the night, which was fine. He was going to enjoy the peace and quiet and solitude that came with being by himself. So there Frank was sitting in the living room, reading a book with the TV on in the background on low volume, just for kind of background noise, and a loud crash sounds out of nowhere from upstairs, followed by heavy footfalls, bum, 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 going right to the base of the stairs. Immediately, Frank throws his book down and runs over to the stairwell and turns his light on. He's panicking, thinking somebody has broken into the house, they've been waiting in one of the closets for the time to steal, and are now trying to get out of the house. Frank already has a little revolver in his hand ready to go, and he is not wasting a second. So he begins to slowly ascend the stairwell, and can see the start of the hallway where the footfalls had ended, and believes that who's ever upstairs was now hiding. And so he gets to the very top, and at the top of these stairs, there doesn't seem to be anyone else around. There's only two rooms and one bathroom. The one room is a storage room, and the room on the far right at the end of the hallway is Bella and Frank's bedroom. And off to the very left of that is a bathroom. So he quickly goes to the storage door, swings it open, turns the light on. There's nobody in there. Just a few boxes, and it is ultimately an empty room. So he immediately turns around, walks down towards the end of the hallway. He notices the bathroom door to his left is closed, but his bedroom door was cracked open. Now, normally Frank and Bella always close their door or so he described and he immediately knew that something was off. So as he goes to push the door open and flick the light on, there's nothing. There's nobody around at all. But the second he walks in the room, he feels this almost terrifying cold air descend upon him. The way he described it was that it didn't come from any which direction except above like a cloud of icy cold air just descended down upon him and he got the worst chill he's ever had. Frank described that he never truly felt an evil presence until that moment and it felt like whoever or whatever this was was now right behind him in the hallway. Quickly turning to react to this, there was nobody there. And so he now began to think he was crazy and began scouring his bedroom looking for the source of the crashing sound because it sounded like a lamp had fallen in the room, but nothing was there. There was nothing wrong. Nothing had fallen. There was nothing out of place. He spent at least a good minute scouring the entire upstairs and source of this noise, but could not find anything. And at this point, Frank began to believe that he was going crazy. So... He left the upstairs, going back down to his chair, and trying to get back into his book, keeping his revolver very close to his side. For comfort, or to drown out his own insanity, he tried to turn the TV up a little louder, 
and try to focus back into his book to take him away from the situation he was in. And within 15 minutes time, he had begun to hear whispering. And then it sounded like a man and a woman having a conversation, but it was very, is how he had described the noise. It wasn't audible, but you could hear two voices distinctly talking. Immediately, Frank shot up again with his revolver in hand, scouting around the house, but the problem was he could not discern the location from these two mysterious whispering voices. It didn't sound like it was upstairs. It did not sound like it was coming from the kitchen, but it sounded like it was coming from all around. Frank began to think he was going crazy. And just as soon as the voices had begun, they had stopped. Bella, whose original plans were to stay the night at her daughter's house, had decided to come home late and she had found Frank up, still at one in the morning, clutching his revolver, terrified. When she had sat down and spoken to him, he explained to her what was going on and claimed that there was either something really wrong with the house or that he was going crazy. And that's when Bella began to tell him all of her own experiences that she had been having up to this very point, but never wanted to mention them to Frank, fear fear that he would laugh at her, make fun of her, not believe her, or whatever other reason there was. Even though these events were very disturbing to Frank and Bella, they never once thought, oh, the house is haunted or it has a spirit or a demon in it. They just thought the house had some quirks, I guess you would call it. Because in Frank's mind, he did not even want to entertain this ridiculous notion that there are spirits or ghosts in the home. To him, that was so outlandish, and there had to be a rational explanation for all the things going on, even though he felt like he was being driven crazy. And this is when Frank had decided to spend a little bit more time outside. Maybe working on the property would kind of help freshen his mind. And perhaps it really was a mold issue in the house that was causing him to hallucinate and go crazy. So he began spending more time working on the shed and working on the garden outside. And this is when he ran into a host of other strange experiences that he could not explain. He would be spending afternoons out there hoeing, raking, pulling weeds, just cleaning things up up and he would hear these mysterious buzzing sounds or humming noises that he could not explain. Now, the way Frank described it was like a giant generator, but about 10 feet below your feet in the ground, or that sometimes it would sound like it was coming from everywhere or above you in the sky, but yet there's clearly no trace of heavy machinery around. Other times, the woods that were full of life and birds would suddenly go silent for an indefinite amount of time and then return suddenly. These things disturbed Frank and really bothered him but he couldn't find a rational explanation to why they were happening. Probably one of the more terrifying experiences Frank had was when he was out on the back side of the house splitting wood right near the thickly wooded tree line where he all of a sudden felt like he was in imminent danger, that something was going to hurt him or attack him. And he began looking around and he began hearing this noise of something really big slowly coming towards his direction. Now, as he looked, because the brush is so thick, he couldn't get a full picture of what was coming towards him. But the one thing that really bothered him was that whatever this was, was not a bear because it was tall and not so much wide and short. That whatever was coming towards him was easily over eight feet tall because of where the branches are on that specific tree he was watching. Frank described that he did not see any details of, of this black mass of a shape approaching the open tree line, but that Frank immediately felt fear, grabbed a piece of the logs he was cutting and chucked it at this shape and began to turn around and move quickly back towards the house. As he's moving back towards the house, he looks back and sees the shape is mysteriously gone now, but that he could feel in the pit of his stomach that something was wrong. Not even two days after this event, Frank was making himself a sandwich in the kitchen when he heard his wife, Bella, pulling up from the house from buying groceries. Within seconds, she lets out a blood curdling scream and sounds like she is in sheer panic. Frank, responding to his wife, runs out to see what the matter is and she is screaming and pointing towards the tree line. But before Frank could even run down and get to her to see what she's pointing at, Bella is running past Frank, pushing him in the house house, screaming at him to lock the doors. Bella is hysterical at what she had apparently saw in the woods. After Frank is practically shaking her, getting her to calm down because she's so hysterical to explain what she saw or what the problem is, she tells Frank that whatever was in the tree line watching her was this large wolf with teeth that were too large to be in its mouth, and that this dog or wolf was so huge it frightened her. Immediately, 
Frank goes and grabs his revolver, walks outside to where the car is and where the bag of groceries had now dropped on the ground, rolling down the driveway. He looks around, but doesn't see anything. Frank, unsure of what to make of his own wife's experience, just decides to be a good husband and comfort her and explain that everything is going to be okay. Even though that would not be the case, and there was something unexplainable about the house they had now moved into in Hendersonville, Tennessee. Frank described that this was really one of the many turning points of when Bella and Frank began to just feel this constant uneasiness, that they were always uncomfortable and felt like they were always looking over their shoulder because something was bound to happen. And this is when Frank described the activity to increase tenfold all around the property, inside the house, outside the house, it did not matter. It seemed like there were things going on beyond the comprehension of both Bella and Frank, but neither one of them would openly admit to demons or ghosts or spirits being on the property or living in the property. Frank had never disclosed him and Bella's religious beliefs, but you'd think by this point, they should have probably called a priest or something along those lines. But they continued to push forward, and within about a week's time, as Frank was moving stuff out to the big work shed, gardening tools and miscellaneous supplies, he had found these large tracks that he simply described were not human and were exceptionally large and also were very, very heavily indented into the ground. Now they were right around the shed and they moved from the shed into the wood line. Frank, feeling immediately uneasy about his newfound discovery, decided to foolishly or not foolishly follow them into the tree line where they abruptly stopped probably about 20 feet up to a small creek. That's when Frank again felt like he was in danger and that something was either luring him in or had trapped him. And it was in that moment that Frank could see that these footsteps had continued going onwards over a small hill past the creek. Deciding not to follow them any further, he runs out of the woods and goes back to the house, not wanting to investigate that any further. Frank had simply assumed that if he was to call somebody or to reach out to somebody to try and come and investigate the property or have anybody look at the things going on, he would either be laughed at, mocked, or he would frighten his wife, Bella, his kids and his grandkids, and he could not have any of that. So being an old timer, he wanted to stay strong and just endure what was coming. Meanwhile, all these events and things kept happening until right around mid-May, where Frank describes strange noises and lights began appearing outside at night in random intervals in random locations. In fact, one evening, Frank was actually awakened out of sleep because he heard what sounded like a crash out near the large meadow by his house and a large flash of light that accompanied it. So he jumps up out of bed, looks out his window, which gives him a perfect view of the meadow, and there was nothing. Even though the crashing sound and the bright blinding light is what had awakened him in the first place, it was little things like this that kept happening over and over. As mid-May turned to late May, the lights began to appear more and more at nighttime, bringing with them this loud metallic humming sound, as Frank described. Although Bella reported never experiencing or seeing any of these lights, only Frank. And in fact, by about the time June had come, Frank was now growing very, very ill. After going to go see several doctors, one of the doctors actually had asked him if he had come into contact with any high amount of radiation, to which Frank looked at him confused at what he was suggesting, but doctor was telling Frank that what he was experiencing fit in with radiation sickness. Unsure of how to process what the doctor was even suggesting, Frank truly began to feel hopeless because now he was growing very ill, he was sickly, and he described that this presence was even stronger in the house and that he believes that whatever this being was, was feeding off the life force of him and Bella. During the course of all these events, him and Bella, who were high school sweethearts, began fighting. And in turn, their relationship had grew very volatile and violent at times, something that had never happened before they had moved in here ever. And by about early June to mid-June, Frank, who had grown completely hopeless and helpless at this point, had decided that it was now time to bring in a priest because he had no other options other than to entertain this notion of spirits in the house, which he hated doing, but decided to swallow his pride and do it anyway. The priest who had come out was scared to even step foot onto the property, let alone inside the house, and kept telling Frank and Bella, there is a great evil here, but I will do the best I can to rid the property. And so the priest did what he does, cleaning and cleansing the entire property, and by the end of it, and had informed Frank and Bella that even though he had cleansed the property, 
This evil was still very powerful and he did not have the ability to do it. Frank would need somebody more qualified. Frank, completely overwhelmed, unsure of what to do or how to handle the current situation him and Bella were in, just decided to move. And by the end of June, they had completely moved out of that house into a small apartment on the other side of Nashville. It took quite a bit of time for Frank and Bella to sell that property, but neither Frank or Bella would ever return there because they were so terrified of the things they had experienced in this Hendersonville property. And while it provided beautiful scenic views, lush woods, property, and meadows, the payoff was just not worth it. Frank tells me that living at that property truly changed his views on the spiritual realm as he describes it and even admits that when he opened that basement door he believes that whatever was in the house was potentially trapped in the basement and had got let out because before that basement door was ever open while living at that property everything was completely fine but after about a week or so of moving in and then after opening the door that's when everything began to change. This experience has stuck with Frank and Bella even now today in 2022. And as far as Frank is aware, the man who had purchased it from Frank and Bella was using it as a vacation home and had experienced zero problems with it. But last he had heard, the property is now sitting vacant and has been for several years. And since Frank and Bella had moved out of that property, they have experienced zero things supernatural, strange, or mysterious. Could it be that that property was truly holding secrets to the unknown and the dead? Or were Bella and Frank just experiencing group hallucinations that had led them to the belief that there truly was something evil there? I'll let you guys be the judge of this one. This next story's events also took place around 2004 to 2015, a chunk of time between Sam's failed marriage in Florida and moving up to Louisville, after which they had moved back to Florida. At the time, Sam had just got through a divorce and was staying with family for a while, afterward buying a home in Summerfield, Florida. This was the same home where he had experienced a UFO while on a walk one night after seeing a star fly across the sky and then cutting a 90 degree angle straight up out of the sky where it appeared to wink or pass through a portal perhaps. Sam had moved into this yellow house with a separate garage in the back on a half acre or so in a very wooded neighborhood that mostly had dirt roads. So it was kind of out more in the middle of nowhere. It was built by an older man from up north in a northern style with an attic, red brick foundation, and even had a basement with a double storm door side entrance, which is quite rare in Florida. From the moment that Sam got in there, it felt a little nippy in the air compared to the outside. Most of the time, especially in the basement, which had a dank feel to it, a moldy old man smell. After Sam had moved in, Often, he felt like he was being watched or seeing a shadow figure out of the corner of his eyes, but when he would turn to look, there was nothing there. As time had gone by, he always felt unwelcome in his own home, a vibe that he just could not shake. The place began to have pest problems too, and he's talking about big ones. Rats the size of his foot and big cockroaches known in Florida as palmetto bugs even termites. Sam did the best he could at the time to get the pest situation under control, but exterminating them did not change the creepy vibes that he felt all the time around that house. He found out later that the woman who sold him the house had gotten into it bad with her own husband and was divorcing him, claiming abuse, and she even slandered him in their church after she had found a bunch of porn on his computer stressing him out and triggering a massive heart attack in the man, causing him to die in that house. After finding this out, Sam had looked up some books about spiritual problems like this one and found one that was particularly great called Prepare for War by Dr. Rebecca Brown. At the time, Sam put what he had learned to use and began for the first time ever a spiritual house cleansing. He would pray over the rooms, asking whatever evil was there to be removed from the home with a Bible and a candle in hand even opening closets and cabinets while doing this. When he got to the very last room, suddenly a cold filled the room and surrounded him. Even though the weather was typical hot Florida weather outside, it was so cold in the room that Sam could barely breathe. Very similar to the events of the very last story. And suddenly, Sam felt this rush of energy enveloping him while he tried to pray over this last room, almost like it was trying to stop him. It was channeling the most negative energy through Sam that he had ever felt before. It was hopelessness, despair, hatred, anger, intense sadness, all rolled into one. 
Sam would burst into tears, but kept on with their prayer, repeating it seven times. Even though he would stop temporarily to this attack and his teeth were chattering because he was terrified. But he had finished the seventh prayer and suddenly the whole room changed to normal, brightening and warming up. It was as if something had jerked that thing up to the ceiling and tossed it away from the house. As if the curse, so to speak, or the energy was now lifted. Sam was elated. Sam had finished it up by taking olive oil, which he had used to pray over to be blessed and anointed the other four areas of the windows and door frames. And things seemed to normalize after that. Sam saw that star moving across the sky one night, wondering if instead it was a UFO or an angel that he had saw watching him. One miracle Sam says he witnessed was after he had anointed the property, a brush fire had broke out from the empty overgrown lot behind his land. And the fire went into a perfect square around the property, not crossing the property lines and went out on its own. Afterward, trees grew along the property lines. Some say that angels holding hands called link angels were all around the house and that's why it happened that way. After that, he'd begin buying extra bedroom sets, mini refrigerators, and begin to rent the rooms out. This would later cause problems unbeknownst to Sam. Also, Sam's ex-wife had got evicted and he had allowed her to come there to for a short time, which he would regret later. He would later learn that if you want to keep evil from your home, don't let evil back into your home. It's like once the place is tarnished again, the evil you had asked to be taken away can come back and be seven times worse than before. And then it brings a lot of help back. And one day, Sam's mom had made a surprise visit and unbeknownst to Sam, his ex-wife had made copies of the keys to the house in case of an emergency. Now, Sam's mom had came in and caught her on a ladder starting to place something in the attic. It turned out to be a hex bag. Sam's ex had a witchcraft book out also on the table. Her and Sam's mother got into a fierce argument, but later the end result eventually was everything getting trashed, Sam being informed of what happened and his ex being sent packing to her daughter's apartment. Over time, Sam had went through a lot of other room renters, which is normal when you just rent rooms. They come and go. But one in particular turned out unbeknownst to Sam to be a witch. But once Sam had already agreed to letting this woman stay in the room, and only later on finding out, he decided to just maybe ride it out and thinking eventually she would leave on her own and move on. And this woman, whoever she was, did not like the fact that Sam was a Christian either. Sam just describes getting those weird vibes. And weird things had happened in the couple years that she was there. Half a dozen black crows repeatedly attacking Sam's roof over his bed every other week. Complaints about some weird smells mixed with incense coming from her room and himself and others seeing a black shadow in the corner of their eyes, but nothing was ever there when they looked. Buzzards hanging out on the roof and occasional nightmares. After she eventually left, it was like the room was cursed. Every person Sam had wanted to rent that room to either got really sick, moved, or died. In fact, one guy got diabetes and died of a severe stroke before the ambulance could take him off the front yard. Blood coming out of his ears and nose, Another guy had got cancer, then completely disappeared, leaving all of his things behind. He had a lot of cash with him from a recent retirement, and, and Sam ran into a lady who knew him and 100% believed a woman at the bar seduced him, probably robbed him with her boyfriend and got rid of the body in one of the national forests, since she bragged about doing this before. Sam would go on to inform the cops, but they didn't care. The old man that died actually used to be a sheriff in South Carolina, too so they could care less. One guy went to a party and got really drunk, passed out and fell back on a rock, fracturing his skull and breaking his neck. Another old guy got sick and the VA told him his body was no longer producing blood and he would have to live off transfusions the rest of his life. He left eventually and got better after he left. Others who stayed had bad luck. In fact, one guy had a nasty breakup with his girl, cops involved, and was bitten by a brown recluse spider in the basement, losing half of his skin on his backside, or got arrested for stupid things and lost the room that way, or started arguments with Sam all the time and have to have them put out. In fact, Sam got so sick of that house that he did a bit of conversion on the garage into a studio to try and get away from it all. Right after he had moved in late one night, 
He was researching the occult in the music industry. His radio alarm clock had clicked on at a time that he had never set it to, and this old rock and roll song came on with the lead singer screaming, The devil knows where you are! Which scared Sam quite a bit. He had been burning DVDs lately and handing them out to people to show them what was happening in the music industry. He guesses that someone or something was pissed off about it, perhaps. Needless to say that he almost broke the darn thing trying to shut it off. Now, the next night after a walk, Sam had come home to see a two and a half foot owl resting on his mailbox, staring at him so intensely it was unnerving. He tried to be funny saying hello in a Jerry Seinfeld voice, but he was none too happy. This owl stayed in the tree all night harassing him with a loud hooting. A little side note here is that owls are commonly seen in the occult as symbolic creatures or even soothsayers. So Sam had kept getting harassed by the 666 numbers often on his cell phone, area code and the seven numbers all sixes. And when he would answer, nobody said anything and just hung up. And so Sam would block the number eventually, but it just kept happening with mixed numbers too. But if he would look, at least three of the numbers were 666 all the time in a variety of different combinations. Another time, Sam had come home from work to see two dozen vultures sitting on his garage. His buddy Joe, who had rented for years from him, and the cable guy as well, saw it also and were freaked out. Two ladies to whom Sam rented to were on the back porch and had claimed to see a shadow of a tall man on the other side of the kitchen window and the window in the back door go walking through the house into that room only afterward for them to find nobody there when they checked. Sam would go on to experience bad luck in relationships and with health, like accidents, for example, falling off ladders, patching roofing, etc. Pet dogs disappearing and the crows beginning to attack his roof above his bed in the garage. Another miracle that Sam believes had happened was after a bad fall, he had popped his lower disc and spine out of place. He couldn't hardly walk. And so one day, his mom calls him and said she would pray for him at her Bible study group. And that very night, he felt a finger go into his back and push his disc back into place. And he could walk fine after that, thanking God. After all of this, Sam had tried to bless the home a couple more times again, but it did not seem to work. He thinks due to the sin going on there amongst the renters who came and went. He went through some more spiritual warfare besides the already mess he'd been involved with involving a close relative with occultic things and tarot cards when she got really sick and was dying at the hospital, unconscious, heart failing, even having worms being found in her lungs. That night, Sam did a risky prayer alone, which should be done by a group called an In the Gap Prayer, where you ask God to use your spirit, your soul, to defend a loved one. That same night, Sam had went to sleep and could see himself in a white glowing robe with a sword of fire. He was walking in a dark, dead place, ground like black volcanic rock, walking through a crowd of demons in the darkness, being kept at bay only by the light of his robe. He could hear the growling like a chorus, and he was guided to whom he was looking for. A demon about 12 to 13 feet tall, built like a bodybuilder. Six fingers, six toes, black claws, skin like green snot, long horns where his ears should be, and a skull face with serrated teeth. He leapt in the air, cut him in half, and he toppled to the ground. He began to pull himself back together, and Sam called out to heaven above, and a bright light came down in a beam focusing on this creature, and it turned, getting sucked into black goo down into the ground. And he had woken up that morning covered in sweat, never experiencing anything like that before. His claim was that it was so real, so real. And amazingly, when he had called the hospital about her, she was awake and recovering great. She had made a quick recovery and two months later, she got baptized and stopped all witchcraft. He believes that this demon was killing her and he was so burned out for two weeks after that, which the book Prepare for War warned about. Sam could have gotten seriously ill or even had a heart attack himself for taking that kind of risk by himself. But back to his house. The icing on the cake was finally what Sam calls the succubus attacks, which happened very often. And when it happened, it felt very real. Only after Sam had shook himself back to full consciousness did he understand that it wasn't real, but that it always left him severely drained, which did feel real. One incident in particular, Sam had thought he'd woke up and was sitting on his bed. 
His door opened and he saw the silhouette of his ex-wife in the light of the door. She didn't have any clothes on and she always had a very noticeable figure. Now, she had come to approach his bed and when she had lied down next to him, he had turned to look at her and there was nothing in her face but a black hole. Like the hair was wrapped around nothing but a black hole and so Sam began screaming trying to get up and she locks onto him like a crab with strength greater than his. All four limbs and he could feel lots of energy draining out of his lower spine into her body. He goes to turn on the side lamp but there was no light bulb and so he finally cries out to God for help and suddenly, this figure that had resembled his ex-wife was gone, and he snapped up to a sitting position covered in sweat. And of course, Sam's sister had always informed him that his ex-wife had a dark aura, probably from being involved in a gang execution up in Chicago. After Sam had recovered from this horrific experience, he got his head together and tried to understand what was going on. Sam eventually found a deliverance pastor, Bill Schnebelin, with a lot of experience since he used to be deep into the occult in his younger years. After finding out more about prayer cleansings, Sam did prayer specifically asking for soul severance ties and all spiritual ties to everyone he has ever slept with and specifically his ex-wife, which afterward he had felt a huge weight lifted off of him. At that point, he decided to just leave the house alone because of the people coming and going and focus on blessing his studio apartment and anointing it with blessed oil on all sides, windows and doors. In fact, one morning, he noticed it was so quiet and thought, where are the crows? He looked around outside on the back door and saw six of them sitting on the branch of a tree just beyond the property, quiet and reserved and staying away from the line. But sadly, he still kept getting odd complaints and bad luck from the renters. One couple had robbed everything out of the room and the mini fridge too. And at one point, he had heard them arguing just outside his door just before they had left and heard a pistol go off. He had heard, Sam had heard her telling the guy no because Sam thinks he was planning to stick Sam just for the cash since Sam just got his weekly payments on Friday night and it was now Saturday morning. Sam had stayed inside quietly waiting and had heard them walk away. Sam waited a while longer then got a bat and went to check the house and they were long gone with all the furnishings. A different couple had tried to sue Sam over some nonsense. At the time, he had met his fiance in Louisville in 2014 and by 2015 was planning to leave. Sam had come home with her one day after being up north with her since his truck driving routes took him to the city and found them complaining about this. And between making threats and things got even worse when he had opened up the door to his studio and found green mold growing all over the things, his couch, even his bed, and he thought to himself, F this, enough is enough. He calls his fiance at the time and they agreed to move everything immediately. So he packed what personal things he could into his truck, which at the time was a white Freightliner condo, 53 feet trailer and bounced and went back to Louisville found a lawyer and bankruptcyed the whole house. Now, of course, this was just a short summarized chapter in Sam's life. He has many more stories after and before that I will gladly share with all of you. And if you enjoyed today's two part story series, be sure to go ahead and smack that like button, leave a comment down below. Let me know what your thoughts are on both stories. And if you guys are new to the channel, be sure to go ahead and subscribe and keep your notifications on. So that way YouTube will let you know every time I release a great new video. And as always guys, keep an open mind, happy Memorial Day, and I'll see you all in the next video.